Oh, come on, Red Rocks Church, you got more than that. Lift up a shout of praise. Make some noise if you love Jesus. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Come on. Welcome to Red Rocks Church, where we are passionate about living on purpose and changing the world. But let me tell you that the starting point of all of that is knowing God more. Not just knowing stuff about him, but knowing him. Because the more you know who this God is, the more you'll know who you are. And the more you know who you are, the more you'll live like he made you that way on purpose. And the more we do that individually, the more we change this world collectively. Amen? So the question then becomes, who is God? Who is God? I want to show you this. Colossians verse, chapter 1, verse 15 says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, which means you want to know what God is like. All you have to do is look at Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says it this way. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. So now the question, who is God, becomes the question, who is Jesus? And that's the question we're going to let Jesus answer for himself over the next seven weeks in this brand new teaching series called I Am, as we journey as a church together through the Gospel of John, and we look at the seven different I Am statements made by the Son of God. The first one today that we find in John chapter 6, verse 35, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And so for week one of I am, the title of this message, titled by Jesus, is the bread of life. Anybody else hungry already? Praise God for carbs. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And when I say you don't wanna miss a single week of this series, I mean you don't wanna miss a single week of this series because the more you know this God, the more he'll begin to transform and change everything about your life that you want transformed and changed. So let's invite his presence. God, we love you. And God, your presence is here and you're about to speak, which means this is no ordinary moment that we share together. This is a holy moment. We recognize that. So we shut out distraction and we get here and now because you are always here and now. Speak to us, we're listening. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, before you sit down, make some noise for the amazing women at our GBB location. Ladies, we love you, we love you, we love you so much. Everybody watching online, all right, give away a high five, maybe a wink and a gun to somebody from across the room and you may take a seat. Good to be with you guys today. And uh, as you can see, I'm celebrating what we call around here Monarch March. Not rocking, but sporting the Nike Air Monarch, the sexiest dad shoe ever made. Great for uh, turbo taxing and lawn mowing. And get yours on sale at Kohl's today for $74.99. And happy Monarch March. I, um... Uh, about a week ago, I wanted to do some scientific research for this sermon, and so I got on Google, and I searched, what is the best smell, like you do? And here were some of the top answers. What, what is the best smell? Freshly mowed grass, cookies right out of the oven. I knew I'd get a few amens for that. <laughs> New car smell. Somebody said boy smell. Not really sure what that is, but you're welcome, I think. Uh, fall candles, campfire, eucalyptus, tea tree oil, lavender, Sharpies, which is not good for you, but I get it. <laughs> Gasoline is also on that list. I would add to that firework smell. You know what I'm talking about? Newborn baby head smell. Yeah, my wife is somewhere amening that right now. And, and while I appreciate all of those answers, I really do, you and me both know, objectively speaking, they are all competing for second place. Because the best smell in the world is Auntie Anne's pretzels. It sneaks in right above Mrs. Fields at the mall. This was a picture my wife took of me at the airport last week. I have no memory of this moment. Because when I smell Auntie Anne's pretzels at the airport, I like black out for about 10 minutes. When I finally come to, I'm just surrounded by pretzel bags. And I'm like, what did I just do? And how much money did I just spend? Auntie Anne's 
pretzels, the best smell in the world. There's nothing better. And um, I just, as silly as this sounds, I think it does give us some insight into what Jesus meant when he said, I am the bread of life. There is just something about freshly baked bread, whether it's salty pretzel bites dipped in honey mustard or Cinnabon or a deep dish pepperoni pizza, it just, it does something for you, man. Like what does hot fluffy bread do? It comforts you, it fulfills you, it satisfies every longing that you have, at least while you're eating it, right? There's a reason that restaurants serve you complimentary bread. It gets you on their good side. It gets your trust because bread is basically a love language. At Olive Garden, breadsticks make you family. If I'm at a restaurant and there's no free bread, I'm like, is this a sick joke? I tell my wife, babe, get your purse. I don't trust these people. Let's go to Olive Garden, where we're all family, because of bread. Because what does hot, fluffy bread right out of the oven, I mean, dipped in olive oil and balsamic with salt and pepper, that, like, that fills you up like a warm hug for your soul. You think carrot sticks do that? Please, get those carrot sticks out of my kitchen. Jesus did not claim to be the broccoli of life, Red Rocks. He showed up claiming to be the bread of life and praise God for that. So what does he mean by that? Here's what I think he means, and this will be on the screen behind me, that God is your provision, which means he's what you need, and, and I think this is even more profound, God is your satisfaction, which means he's also what you want. I'll give you a verse for each of these. Philippians 4.19, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Jehovah Jireh, one of the names for God that we just sang about. He meets your needs. He is your provider. He is what you need, and he has what you need. He is your provision, but not just that. He's also your satisfaction. Psalm 103, verses two and five say this. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. And then Psalm 103 just goes on to list the benefits of knowing God, including verse five, who satisfies your desires with good things. You know those, those desires that we so often try to satisfy with sinful things or even common things? God wants to satisfy with good things. He gave you those desires in the first place so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Yes, please. He is your provision. And more than that, he is your satisfaction. He is the bread of life. I'll explain it this way. Like there's a reason you want that beach house in Malibu or that new sports car. And I do too. I'm praying for it, I'll pray for you to get it. I'll come visit. We'll drive your Ferrari down the PCH together because just like bread, that really does something for you, man. It does. But also just like bread, you're gonna be hungry again. Probably sooner than you think. To quote Switchfoot in an album released 21 years ago this week, <laughs> it was a beautiful letdown the day I knew all the riches this world had to offer me would never do. That revelation is a beautiful letdown. And Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. He's saying, I am your provision and your satisfaction. In other words, God can do for you in fullness and forever what a new house or a new car can do in part and for a few months. If you think about it, what are you really after in that new career or that new relationship in that new city in the next high or the next hookup. I'll say it this way. What are you really trying to buy when you buy all the stuff that you buy? Peace, joy, eternal significance, meaning, contentment. Those are the things the bread of life is trying to satisfy and provide for you which is crazy because that means that in seasons of desperation and seasons of disappointment, two seasons that are very challenging in the human experience, but also profound because they can become beautiful letdowns. And if you're in a season of desperation, that means you are primed with an opportunity to find out firsthand that God is all you need. And if you're walking through a season of disappointment, you are primed with an opportunity to find out firsthand that this God is also all you want all you want. He is the bread of life. And throughout the next seven weeks, I wanna invite you to join us as we read through the Gospel of John as a church. And we have a reading plan for you, so if you just download the Red Rocks Church app, you can do it at that QR code right there. 
and customize it to this location. There's just tons of, tons of content there to help you to know God more, including this Gospel of John reading plan. And we're gonna take it nice and slow, and I think God has a lot to speak to you in your quiet time with him, 10 minutes every morning. And I wanna challenge you to follow with us as we read through the Gospel of John. And let me say, if you are hungry to go deeper in your faith, this is the series for you. And if you are brand new to the Bible, this is also the series for you. The, the Bible is essentially the New Testament and the Old Testament. The New Testament is, it, it begins with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four, the four gospels, the four vantage point stories of the biography of the life and ministry of Jesus, right? And any one of them, by the way, is a great place to start reading the Bible, but specifically John, and here's why. Not only is John the self-proclaimed best friend of Jesus and the self-proclaimed fastest disciple, another story for another day, but John, the reason it's a beautiful work of art is because it includes seven miracles or signs of Jesus and the seven I am statements of Jesus as well. Seven. There's something significant about the number seven, not just in scripture, but just in life, just in life. Seven days in a week, going all the way back to the creation account in Genesis, seven wonders of the ancient world, seven natural wonders made by God, seven notes on a musical scale, seven colors in a rainbow, seven black dots on any given ladybug. I could just give you seven facts like this for hours, like all day. Seven years at Hogwarts. John Elway wore the number seven. Just remembered I'm not in Colorado right now, but I'll amen that. Amen, pastor, that's good, thank you, it is good. Seven, seven. I learned from Levi Lusco last week, seven is the amount of days it takes for your top layer of skin to completely regenerate itself. So your top layer of skin that you're wearing to church today is not the one you were wearing last week. So what happened to that layer? You vacuumed it up. We're breathing it in right now, so thank you. Actually, we had all these chairs and the carpet deep cleaned this week. We were due, man. Yeah, some amens for that. <laughs> Seven is the amount of years it takes for your whole body, every single cell, to completely regenerate itself to make you a brand new person. Seven is referred to as the channel capacity of your brain. It's the reason there's only seven digits in every American phone number minus the area code because they know as soon as we have to memorize something beyond seven, for most of us, our brains pop and shut down. There's something about seven. If you read Revelation, the last book in your Bible, seven is on every single page from seven letters to seven churches, seven bowls, seven trumpets, seven seals. How about this for a flex? There are exactly 700 references to the number seven in scripture. Jesus said, forgive your enemies 70 times, seven times. The people of God walking around the walls of Jericho, seven times because seven represents completion. And so John, the author of, John, we're gonna get it, you little theologians, <laughs> rather than writing everything Jesus said and did, which he, by the way, said would be impossible, he says this himself in John 21, verse 25, I'm gonna read it for you just because I think it's funny. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So John picks seven to give us a complete picture of everything Jesus does and who Jesus is. Seven miracles that Jesus performed as signs to point to what he can do for you and the seven I am statements of Jesus to show who he wants to be to you. Seven. Does anybody know, by the way, the very, the number, the first miracle? You're gonna read about it this week in John chapter two. The first thing that Jesus does, the first sign, happens at a wedding. He turns water into wine Amen. I knew nobody at Red Rocks would have a problem with that miracle. And not, not boxed wine. This, is, this isn't yellowtail Chardonnay or barefoot Zinfandel. This, is, this isn't three buck Chuck from Trader Joe's. This is the son of God at a wedding in Cana when a young couple was running out of wine in a week-long celebration, which in that culture was a big no-no. Jesus shows up and he turns six water basins made of stone full to the brim of water into fine wine to show us he's the God of more than enough. I heard it said earlier this week, all of your fears can kind of be summed up into two categories, the fear of falling short and the fear of running out. 
I know you can relate to those. I can too, especially the second, the fear of running out, the fear of running out of money, of running out of time, of running out of opportunities, of energy, of the fear of running out of like whatever it is, ideas, creativity, the fear of, of running out. And Jesus in this beautiful moment shows us that he is the God who is the provider. Jehovah Jireh, he has what you need. He is the God of more than enough. It's the whole point of John chapter two. And that takes us into John chapter three, right before the second miracle where Jesus heals the official son. John chapter three is a famous conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus the Pharisee in the middle of the night where the carpenter Jesus teaches the Pharisee about God. And I picture that scene in The Chosen where John is hiding outside the window, eavesdropping and recording the most quoted conversation in human history, where Jesus says, my father so loved this world, that's why I'm here. That's why he sent me, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. That's John chapter three, which takes us into John chapter four, where Jesus heals the official son in miracle number two, and then he rendezvous with the Samaritan woman by the well and chats her up. Jesus would be the chatty guy next to you on the plane. You have your headphones in, and he's just talking to you. He just chats this woman up and says, you know, this water, you're gonna drink it, but you're gonna be thirsty again. But I have water, whoever drinks it, living water, will never thirst again. That's John 4, which takes us into John chapter 5, where Jesus heals the, par the paralyzed man next to the pool of Bethesda, who for 38 years couldn't get to the water, so now living water comes to him. And that takes us to John chapter 6, which is packed full of stories, including the fourth and fifth miracles of Jesus and the very first I am statement of Jesus. The fourth miracle, by the way, is when Jesus feeds 5,000 people. It's the only story uh, that other than the resurrection that is mentioned in all four of the gospels, which right there says something. But many scholars believe it was 5,000 men recorded and somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 people total. Hungry people, hangry people who show up to hear Jesus preach and there's no catering. And there's this really cute sort of moment where Jesus, to test Philip, one of his disciples, he turns to Philip and in verses five and six says, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked him only to test him. Where shall we buy bread? Somebody say where. Where shall we get this bread? He was only testing him for he already had in mind what he was going to do. What does that mean? Jesus has solutions to problems you don't even know about yet. And God is working behind the scenes even when you can't see it, especially when you don't feel it. That's sometimes when God is doing his best work. Hey, Philip, where are we gonna get enough food to feed all of these people? I love that he says where, because guarantee you, Philip, like any of us would, is thinking how. How are we gonna do this? because you're practical and I am too, and we do have a practical God, make no mistake about it. But please understand before he's a practical God, he's a personal God who's trying to get you to see where. Where, where does provision come from? A provider. Psalm 121 verses one through two. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who, by the way, made heaven and earth by talking. He speaks and he makes oceans and mountains and stars. They just appear. So what does that mean? You don't have to worry about provision when you personally know the provider. Gifts are great, but you get to know the giver of the gifts. That's the whole point of Jesus. You get to know God. You get to know him. So Philip, where will we get bread? And bear in mind, Jesus never asks a question because he needs an answer. He's trying to show us something. He's trying to show us that he did not come to start a bakery. He came to be the bread, to be the bread. And in your life right now, if your desire and focus is on the, pro the provision, whatever provision means to you right now in this season, as long as your focus is on the provision, you will always be afraid of running out of it. But if your desire and focus is on the provider and you fix your focus on the God who knows not just what you need, but also even what you want, those desires in your heart because he put them there. 
When you seek first his kingdom and you get to know the God who makes more bread, but not just that, constellations, just by speaking, you will never fear falling short or running out. Amen? John, John includes the, the detail nearby. Somebody say nearby. He says there's a little boy nearby that has five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus takes it, gives thanks for it, feeds 20,000 people with it, and there's leftovers. Because God can take what you have and make it enough. Excuse me, more than enough. It's just for him to be able to do that. You first have to give him what you have. So I wonder, what do you have that's maybe, it's not obvious because it's too obvious because it's too nearby that you're not giving to him and God's going, that's what I want. So you're praying huge prayers. God, use me in crazy big ways. And he's saying, all right, leave work on time tonight and go have dinner with your family. That's what I want. That's what's nearby. Give me that. God, I need, I need financial breakthrough. We need more provision. And God is saying, until you do this whole money thing my way with what you do have, what's nearby, I can't bless the rest of it as much as I want to. Maybe financial breakthrough for you begins with the budget. It's nearby. God, what do you have planned for me next? What's my next season? And, and God, as a loving father, would say, you're, you're thinking about the next career and the next city and the next relationship, but you want to know what I really have next for you? Tonight at 7 p.m., turn off all your screens and spend the evening with me. That's what I want next for you and from you. That's what's nearby. I'm the God of more than enough, but you've got to give me what you have. See, Jesus feeds 20,000 people with one little boy's lunch and there's leftovers and then Jesus is tired and so he climbs a mountain by himself to pray and spend time with his father and the crowd is clearing out and by the way, this feeding and this church service happens on the beach of the Sea of Galilee and so while Jesus is up on the mountain, his disciples hop in a boat and they row across the sea to the other side to Capernaum and they get halfway across when a storm hits, and that's when Jesus decides to meet them on foot, hops into the boat, and they row the rest of the way together. By the way, how many miles across is the Sea of Galilee in that exact spot? Seven. Is that a coincidence? I don't know, man, but it's crazy. I doubt it. I was digging into it this week and I was thinking, has anybody else seen this? Am I reading way too much into it? Because Capernaum, where they travel to, is called the village of Nahum. That's what Capernaum means. Nahum means comfort. So the village of comfort. Now, here's what I think is crazy. Jesus feeds 20,000 people comfort food and they love him. So they all get into boats and follow him to the village of comfort. And they start asking him for more. Hey, can you, can, what else can you give us? Can you do more miracles? Can you do more signs? And, and Jesus starts to challenge them. And say, he says, you're, you're only after me for the provision and what I can do for you. You're not after who I want to be in your life. You just want to know what I can do for you. And, and then he starts challenging them. I think it's crazy when he feeds them comfort food, they love him. And then as soon as he challenges them and calls them to the next level, they leave him. By the way, the verse where they, it says thousands of them leave Jesus after he challenges them is John 6, verse 66. Is that a coincidence? I don't know. It's eerie. I'm not a guy who like, oh my gosh, look at this code, you guys, that I just cracked. All I know is seven is completion, and six is when you just fall short. And I go, oh, you stopped at six. You left him. You walked away just too soon. But Jesus challenges them and they, they leave and some of them stick around and start arguing with them and say, well, what else can you do for us? Can you? And then they go Old Testament on them and they say, you know, our ancestors in the wilderness, they ate the manna from heaven that Moses provided for them. Manna is the daily bread from God. Give us this day our daily bread. Moses got it for him and that's where Jesus, he kind of said, okay, hold, hold up. Y'all think way too highly of Moses, first of all. He was a stud, he was a prophet, but it wasn't Moses who brought the manna. That was my father who did that. By the way, I was there too. 
the Son of God. We brought the manna from heaven to meet their physical needs, but I have come now as the bread of life to meet not just your physical needs, but your spiritual needs more important. And he says this in John 6, verse 33. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then he has a mic drop moment where he says, that's me, I am the bread of life. I'm the provision who knows what you need. I'm the satisfaction who knows what you want. Nothing else will do. And you can keep trying. That's why he challenges them. Nothing else is gonna do it. And he calls them to a higher level of living. He disrupts their regularly scheduled program. A lot of us, I've said this to you before, a lot of us associate Christ with comfort and the devil with disruption. When in reality, it might be the devil keeping you nice and comfy and the son of God trying to get your attention. If God were telling you something you didn't wanna hear, would you hear him? When was the last time he, he did that and you heard something you didn't want to hear? He feeds comfort food, you love him. When he challenges you, what will you do? Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. You can keep looking for it in anything else under the sun, but you will not find the eternal provision and satisfaction your soul is looking for because Jesus knows Ecclesiastes 3.11 and it says this, and this is so key for you to get. He has made everything beautiful in its time. And then this is about you. He has also set eternity in the human heart. What does that mean? You have eternity written into your heart. You feel that. It's the reason you know you're made for something beyond this life. It's the reason death does not sit well with you. You see death, you smell death, and you know something's off. This is not right. This is not why I'm created. Because there's eternity written into your heart. There is a space in your heart the size of forever, if you will. And nothing temporary, no matter how good it is, no matter how great they are, can truly fill it. Or satisfy it. Only something eternal will do that. I recently read Matthew Perry's book, Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing. It's really good. It's about as honest as a biography gets, and I appreciate that a lot. The Big Terrible Thing is in reference to his lifelong battle with addiction, and um, it was so fascinating to me. A few different times he said the reason he abused Vicodin and vodka was because in those moments, it was the thing, the only thing that made him feel, quote unquote, taken care of. He said, and when I felt taken care of, all of a sudden, I just wanted to take care of everybody else because I had what I need and what I want. So my life was now generous. There was like an overflowing spirit where I just, and one of the ways he made everybody else feel taken care of was by making them laugh, which of course he was so good at. And tragically, you know, last October, his life was cut short way too early. And he's missed now by about a billion people. And rest in peace, Matthew Perry. But it's just fascinating to me that one of the men who more than anybody else in history made more people on this planet laugh said he was funniest when he was the most taken care of. He was the most generous. He can make you laugh, not because he needed you to for his ego, but because he knew you needed to. I'm just, I'm taken care of. I have what I need, I have what I want, at least until this drug wears off. Eat that bread and you will be hungry again. In the Old Testament, King Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes 3 about eternity in your heart, but his life, I mean, his life was one giant experiment because Solomon had more wealth, more women, more achievements, more opportunities, more power and more fame than anybody else in the history of history and the wisdom to steward all of it. And his life was a giant experiment put on this planet to use all those resources available to him to essentially try to find lasting fulfillment and satisfaction in anything under the sun. And he tried. And this was his conclusion at the end of his life. Ecclesiastes 4.4, he says, I saw all toil and all achievements spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless. And then here's the crutch. The crux, a chasing after the wind. So I did this a few weeks ago just to prove a point to myself. But the next time it's windy out, go outside and try to catch it. And when you can't, let it be a reminder to your heart of the eternal satisfaction it is hunting for and searching for. 
because as we move into the future, it's only gonna get windier out there, you guys, with more and more ads promising to, to fix you and more and more products, new ideas claiming this, this is what will make you feel whole and complete. It's only gonna get windier. And if Solomon couldn't catch it, if Matthew Perry couldn't catch it, do you think you could catch it? We've all had wealthy people tell us money's not gonna make you happy, and we kind of nod and smile and agree, but then secretly we're like, but I'm still gonna try. <laughs> and go for it, man. Be successful. Be excellent. Christians should be, but not to pursue eternal significance and satisfaction because you know that is a carrot on a stick. You will not be the exception to that. And we need to intellectually observe the world around us and people who are trying and failing at it, people who have come and gone before us. And we need to conclude more of what I have that's already not working, by the way, is not the answer. And I will not be the exception. I am a child of God and I have learned and I have resolved that I do not chase wind because I know the bread of life who is my provision and is my satisfaction, what I need and what I want. And the more that that becomes a revelation, information makes you smarter, but revelation where you find out firsthand, the more that those truths become real to you, the more you enjoy all of this because you need it less. That's why the healthiest marriage is full of two people who understand this, who find what they need and what they want in the only eternal thing that can fill the space of forever in your heart. And they show up to a marriage no longer needing to take and suffocate the other person by making them be something they can't be. But now you show up with something to give. I'm taken care of, so now I can take care of. Everything else now becomes house money because you have the bread of life. Jesus is my provision. Jesus is my satisfaction. Because if eternity really is written into your heart and only something eternal can fill it, then this is the greatest news ever because you have that something eternal. Like what Jesus said to the woman at the well. He said, you're gonna be thirsty again if you drink that water, but I'm living water. And, and he says this, and I quote, I'm paraphrasing, that wells up to eternity within you. Two chapters later in John 6, the metaphor changes from water to, to bread. And he says this in verse 27. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. And then he says, I am that bread of life. And if that's true, getting a revelation of that will change everything. The richest man in the world is trying to buy that revelation and can't. He is your provision and your satisfaction. Man, Paul said in, the, in, in, I think, 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, if Jesus isn't back from the dead, then us Christians should be the most pitied of any people group on the planet. But if he is, and this whole thing is real, and one man born 2,000 years ago on the other side of the world with no platform and no prominence at all has changed the world so much that he has divided history in half, if Jesus really is back from the dead, then we are the least pitied people group on the planet. And shouldn't we be the most, to quote Matthew Perry, taken care of people who are just taking care of everybody and everything else because I've got my provision, I've got my satisfaction, the rest is house money. Like, shouldn't we be like the, the most easygoing, the funniest, the funnest, fun-loving, most generous overflowing of spirit, servant-hearted people because I've got everything I need and everything I want in the bread of life. I know how the story ends and I know not just where or not just how, but I know where. It's a person, his name is Jesus and he is the bread of life, amen? You have a, a communion cup. If you don't have one, just raise your hand. Overflow, just raise your hand and an usher will uh, just shout as loud as you can if you, I'm kidding. Um, our ushers will come get one for you. And I just want you to take out the, uh, the wafer cracker that represents the bread. And um, the bread of life. And I just want you to hold it for a few moments while I talk to you. We make some noise for our ushers, by the way. We love you guys. Thank you. 
So this is the meal your soul is really searching for. The only question is, are you hungry for it? Are you hungry for it? We did our very first GBB worship night last week. Mackenzie, not just an amazing worship leader, but she's our outreach ministry lead. She basically like broke us into that prison to do this worship night. So many hoops and loops you have to jump through. And uh, it was incredible. 189 women showed up for it. And I don't know what the word you think of when you look at those pictures is. I'll tell you what I think. Hunger. It was my job to get up at the start of the night and hype everybody up. And I found out in about seven seconds how unnecessary I was. Because they were hyped up already. They were, it was electric. There was so much passion. And it didn't matter if I was funny. And it didn't matter if the speakers went in and out. Or if somebody missed a chord or if Mackenzie forgot a word. It's called Hunger. And I realize, and this will be on the screen too, you don't need hype when you're hungry. And the more that you've been filling up on the bread of the world, that's when you come into church and you need somebody to hype you up if you're gonna worship. The more you've been filling up on the things of the world, you show up to any church and it's about your preferences before it's about our purpose as the church of Jesus. But when you get hungry, for the provider, not only do you get that provision thrown in along the way, I think of that quote, if you aim for heaven, you get heaven and earth thrown in. If you aim for earth, you miss both of them. Man, you get hungry for the provider, give us this day our daily bread. So many of us think that uh, God's goal is to get you to a place where you no longer need him. So much provision that you're good without the provider, it's not. We think what? He's thinking who? Where does provision come from? Where does my help come from? From the Lord, from the provider who gives me this day my daily bread. This is the body of Christ broken for you. By his stripes you are healed. By his life you are filled. So let's take and eat. God make us hungry. And then go ahead and Grab the juice. This is the blood of Christ, the perfect, spotless, willingly shed blood of Christ. What washes away your sin? What gets you into heaven? Nothing but this. Jesus plus nothing equals everything that you need. The grace that saved you is the grace that sustained you every day. So let's drink this in remembrance of that. Amen? I'm reminded again of John 4 when Jesus is chatting with the woman at the well and his boys go into town to buy some lunch and when they come back, Jesus isn't hungry and they're like confused. Did he get food somewhere else? Did he already eat lunch? And, and Jesus says to them, and I quote, I have food you don't know about. This is the meal he was referring to. And I just see a community, a church, that lives in such a way that demands an explanation from the world looking at us from the outside in. How are you guys so passionate? How are you so full of life? We have food you don't know about. But I know the circumstance you're walking through. I know how heavy this season is. How are you walking through life so freely and so lightly? I have food that you don't know about. How do you just take care of everybody else? I'm taken care of because I have food that you don't know about. The devil's not afraid of a big church. The devil's afraid of a hungry church. Blessed are those who hunger for the things of God, for you will be filled with the things of heaven. And so how do you get hungry? This is my last thought before we worship. I wanna answer that two ways. How do you get hungry? You give what you have, and you do what you know. Because in our country, man, we have the privilege of not really knowing in fullness what hunger is on a daily basis. And praise God for that. So how do you on purpose get hungry? How do you get hungry? How do you get hungry? You give what you have, 
and you do what you know. So first of all, you give what you have nearby, nearby. Give what you have nearby. You're afraid of running out of time today. I bet if you gave God your first 15 minutes every morning, you would watch him supernaturally multiply your time for the rest of the day. When you work out, you give, you spend energy, and it generates more energy at the end of the day. Give what you have. Why? Because you will get what it is that you give. So Jesus, you can have my lunch break. You can have the first consideration in this big decision I'm making. You can have the first 10% of this paycheck. You can have these five loaves of bread and these two fish because you're an Ephesians 3.20 kind of God and you can do exceedingly and abundantly more, not just what I could do on my own, but everything I could imagine doing on my own. You give what you have and you do what you know. See, a lot of times we'll, we'll sit in church and there'll be, even if we like the sermon, it's sort of general truth that then we walk out of here into very specific circumstances. And so because of that, we think, I don't know what to do, though. I don't know what God wants me to do. But I want to challenge you on that. I think you do know what to do. And I think the more you do what, to, what you know, the more you'll know what to do. The more you do what you know, the more you'll know what to do. So once again, working out. Like, you know enough to be physically healthy and, and fit. I promise you do. You don't need Chris Hemsworth's secret morning routine. You don't need that next piece of workout equipment. I would argue you're using more knowledge to procrastinate doing what you already know. You know how to do a push-up and a sit-up and run around the block and eat this and not that. You know what to do, so do what you know. You know how to access this reading plan to go through the Gospel of John. Even if you don't have a Bible, you know we have them for free right there. And even if you can't get one from there, you could think of 10 other ways to get a Bible, including the free Bible app. If you thought about it for two minutes, do what you know. You know how to fast. You just don't eat. That's all you have to do is just not eat. Man, we really are like the first generation and culture since Jesus where fasting isn't a normal part of our faith. We soften that teaching because we don't want to be hungry. But man, when you get hungry for the things of God, and you feast on the word of God, you get hungry for the bread of life, fasting awakens something in heaven that demands a response that changes stuff within you and the world around you. Blessed are those who hunger. How do you get hungry? Maybe you know this dating relationship that is not God honoring, that you're in right now, that you're supposed to end this. You're just terrified of the season of loneliness that's waiting for you. And while I get that, if I could just redefine that season of loneliness, all loneliness is in that version of it is desperation. Desperation is a kind of hunger. And blessed are those who hunger for the things of God, for you will be filled with the things of heaven. And that season of desperation is an opportunity for you to find out firsthand, not because you read a book about it and not because you listened to a sermon about it but because you experienced it that God is my provider in everything that I need and if you're walking through a season of disappointment and you and the things of this world everything beneath the sun has let you down on their promises they've made to you then you are primed for an opportunity to get that revelation the richest man on the world can't buy that Jesus is also your satisfaction and can be everything that you want and the more that you get that Everything else is house money because you have the bread of life. Amen. Red Rocks, will you stand? <laughs> Exodus chapter three. God is having a conversation with Moses through a burning bush in a cave on a mountain. And he says, Moses, take off your sandals because the ground beneath your sandals is holy. Why was it holy ground? Because the presence of God was there and he was about to speak. You and me live in a different era than Moses did. Jesus is back from the dead. We now live in an era where dead messiahs stand up and walk out of their tombs, and the presence of God is no longer hidden behind a veil. The veil has been torn, and the presence of God is within you and all around you, and he's speaking, which means this is holy ground. This is a holy moment with your maker. He tells Moses, go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And then Moses gives God a long, extensive anti-resume of all the reasons God shouldn't use him and can never love him. And God debunks all of it. And then says, I told you, I'll tell you again. Go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses says, all right, I'll do it. But who should I tell Pharaoh sent me? 
In other words, what is your name, God? And God says, I'll tell you what my name is. You go tell Pharaoh, the one who sent you is called I am. I am. Outside of time and space, past, present, and future, the God who was, who is, and who is to come. I am what you need me to be whenever it is that you need me to be it. I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the vine. I am the one and only God. I am. Amen. So God, we love you. You're all we want. You're all we need. And we sing those words now, believing it a little bit more. Take this information, turn it into revelation that makes us more like you. Take the world, give us Jesus, make us hungry. A hungry church is a dangerous church to the devil. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen.